The United States of America has announced it is in transition and from now on will identify as a teenage girl. The nation's pronouns will be any random series of recently invented slang terms and an unbearably high-pitched shrieking noise. The now female adolescent nation made the transition announcement during an interview in Vanity Fair. Not the magazine, but the allegorical location built by Beelzebub in Pilgrim's Progress, where everything that can satisfy human delight and desire is up for sale. Which, come to think of it, may also describe the magazine. In announcing her transition, the United States said she had spent too long trying to fulfill cisgender male stereotypes through such actions as crossing perilous seas to escape religious persecution, defying the elements to settle a savage land, defeating the Nazis in World War II, and facing down the communists in the Cold War. From now on, the U.S. said she would express her authentic teenage girl inner self by stomping around the room shouting that's so unfair about every little thing and insisting her completely irrational hormonal babblings should be taken seriously as if they bore some relation to reality. In her new identity as a teenage girl, the United States said she would engage in such gender-appropriate activities as gathering in mean, gossipy cliques that exclude anyone who disagrees with them, throwing hysterical tantrums whenever her latest whims aren't met at whatever fantastic cost she demands, and, of course, developing crushes on dishonest sleazeballs like Andrew Cuomo and Ibram Kendi while totally destroying the lives of perfectly nice people who tweeted something silly when they were 12 years old. Where the old male United States languished in such stereotypical patriarchal behaviors as spreading liberty and inventing everything from the light bulb to the personal computer, the new teenage girl America will finally be free to play dress up and buy anything she wants on credit because she just absolutely has to have it or she'll totally die. The United States said that while trapped inside a male body, she had been forced to be a nation of laws and not of men which she described as just so utterly basic. But now she felt free to govern by simply saying things like, Aw, look at the poor illegal immigrant, afterward posting a picture of how compassionate she is on Instagram while the illegal takes an American's job. The United States did admit that in her new identity as a teenage girl, she had once gotten incredibly drunk and woken up in bed with Iran, but she said that was so totally not her fault. Then she made a sexy fish face and accidentally set fire to the Constitution, which also so totally wasn't her fault. No, really. Totally. Trigger warning. I'm Andrew Claven, and this is The Andrew Claven Show. I feel hunky dunky, life is tickety boo. Birds are winging, also singing, hunky dunky dee doo. Ship shaped, tipsy topsy, the world is a bitty zing. It's a wonderful day, hurrah, hooray, it makes me want to sing. Oh, hurrah, hooray. Oh, hooray, hurrah. All right, the vast right-wing conspiracy known as Clavenon marches on. We've got the football great uh, Brett Favre with us today. Uh, I, I prefer to say Brett Favre, the, the original French, La Brette Favre. Uh, but we did a great interview with him. Uh, please go on iTunes and subscribe and give us a five-star review. It's very helpful. Also go on uh, YouTube and subscribe to the Andrew Claven channel, my personal channel. And if you ring that little bell there, I personally will come by your house and bring you uh, fresh content uh, and maybe some cupcakes. Also, if you leave a comment there and the comment is just, uh, you know, sufficiently cruel, uh, bigoted, nasty. We'll just include it in the show and it'll blend right in with the rest of what we're doing here. Today, we have a comment from David Winoker, who says, uh, speaking of Lil Nas X's uh, satanic shoes, he says, once Nike, uh, disco- Nike discovered that the blood in the Satan shoes was from Uyghurs, <laughs> they dropped the, the suit. Uh, that, that was really cruel uh, and, and disgusting and bigoted and fits right in. Also, uh, you want to subscribe so you can be in next week's mailbag. We will answer all your questions. Now, there's a new way to get to the mailbag. You still have to subscribe to dailywire.com, but then you hit watch. You go to the Andrew Claven Show. And then the mailbag is right on the bottom left. Now, you can do that, right? It's watch Andrew Clavin Show mailbag is on the bottom left. And you can ask anything you yeah. want. You, that is what you will sound like after we answer your question. You can ask about your personal life, your religious questions, your political questions. All my answers are guaranteed 100% correct and will change your life. And we'll get to whether they change your life uh, for the better after you get out of the hospital.
Everyone who looks at the disaster that is The Andrew Clavin Show asks me, why did you not use ZipRecruiter? I can only lament, I just didn't know. But if you're a business owner who's hiring, you probably face a lot of challenges when it comes to finding the right person for your role. And that's why hiring can feel like trying to find a needle in a haystack. Some of the people we hired were actual needles we found in haystacks. Sure, you can post your job to some job board, but then all you can do is hope the right person comes along, which is why you should try ZipRecruiter for free at ZipRecruiter.com slash Clavin. When you post a job on ZipRecruiter, it gets sent out to over 100 top job sites with one click. Then ZipRecruiter's matching technology finds people with the right skills and experience for your job and actively invites them to apply. ZipRecruiter is so effective that four out of five employers who post on ZipRecruiter get a quality candidate within the first day. So while other companies overwhelm you with way too many options, ZipRecruiter finds you what you're looking for, that needle in a haystack. And right now you can try ZipRecruiter for free at ZipRecruiter.com slash Clavin. Once again, remember to go to this unique place, ZipRecruiter.com slash Clavin. ZipRecruiter is the smartest way to hire if and only if you can spell Clavin, which is K-L-A-V-A-N. I want to start today with a terrific quote from G.K. Chesterton, great journalist and Catholic thinker. Uh, and I, I can't quote the whole thing because it goes on very long, but just the, I want to get to the point of it, which he says, truths turn into dogmas the instant they are disputed. We who are liberals once held liberalism lightly as a truism. Now it has been disputed and we hold it fiercely as a faith. We who believe in patriotism once thought patriotism to be reasonable and thought little more about it. Now we know it to be unreasonable and know it to be right. We who are are Christians never knew the great philosophical common sense, which inheres in that mystery until the anti-Christian writers pointed it out to us. The great march of mental destruction will go on. Everything will be denied, so everything will become a creed. Fires will be kindled to testify that two and two make four. Swords will be drawn to prove that leaves are green in summer. We shall be left defending not only the incredible virtues and sanities of human life, but something more incredible still, this huge, impossible universe which stares us in the face. And I think that that is the the state we are in right at this moment. All the basic verities of life, all the things we simply took for granted because they're obviously true, have been refuted by the left. And so we have made them into uh, a cult, a cultic religion. We are demanding that uh, two and two make four because they are denying that two and two makes four. So now for the last three weeks, I start with this because for the last three weeks, I feel like we've had a sort of theme on the show. I've been discussing unfolding an idea that was uh, playing out in my mind, which is the idea that the way that reform and rebellion against uh, physical human leaders can bleed into rebellion against creation, against God, and that once you get there, you've stopped reforming, you've become a radical, and you've become evil. So, for instance, you know, we've talked about this a lot, and I, I want to move on from this into a connected but new idea that I, I want to develop. But I, I think it's important just to to remind you that this idea was that, you know, it's one thing for, for women to want more freedom of action and to feel oppressed by human leaders and say that they should reform society. But the idea that a person exists outside her physical being and can abandon her womanhood entirely is simply absurd. Then you're actually rebelling against reality itself. And I've explained that I think the reason people do that is that the people who are assigned by God to represent God in the world, authorities, parents, powers, bosses, kings, presidents, all those people fail us. And if we don't understand that they were just representatives of the great power and they are human and flawed and fallible, we may then accuse the great power of their flaws. And that's a a confusion we have. It's a mistake we make. Freud said that God was just the projection of our fathers. But what I'm saying is that our fathers are actually, we project God onto our fathers, our human fathers. And that's how we get confused about this. And this is what happened in the French Revolution is they started out fighting against the king and then started out fighting against nature itself and turned in to the terror. And it's what's happening now in America as a reasonable response to some civil injustices has become a sort of sickness centering on race and gender and a dismissal, an attempt to overcome the physical self. Now, I I came to these ideas in my personal life. I mean, this is something that I, I learned through living. I, uh, I've written about this in my memoir, The Great Good Thing. I, I went insane when I was in my late 20s. I actually had a complete uh, breakdown. I was twisted. I was broken. Uh, my heart was dark. Uh, my thoughts were, were twisted. I became mystically crazy. I became a hypochondriac. I was completely uh, paralyzed and couldn't move. And 
through the grace of God, I found a brilliant, brilliant psychiatrist who healed me. And with the way our conversations went, it was kind of Freudian, right? He was kind, he was a neo-Freudian, but he was still a Freudian. And I'm the only person I ever knew who actually went sane. I mean, when I left that, his therapy, I was a completely different person. I was joyful. I was able to succeed in my life and do the things that I wanted to do. I was certain of myself and I was, I was in motion. I was growing. I was emotionally growing. But one of the things that occurred to me after I left therapy was that all the things we had talked about, the ideas that we were, that some of our therapy was based on, the Freudian ideas, were untrue. They were untrue. Uh, the, there is no, the, the Oedipal complex is not normal in human beings. It may occur in human beings, but that was Freud's basic central idea. All of Freud's theories were basically made up. He was kind of a quack. He was a quack of genius, but he was a quack. But there was one thing he said that was true, which was that we can transfer feelings onto other people. That's what he called the transference. And that when you talk to a therapist, he becomes a mentor, he becomes a father figure, maybe a woman becomes a mother figure. And you can then, through the love you feel for that person, for the actual therapist, you can then reenact the act of growing up. You have somebody to represent the love that your father or your mother didn't represent to you, and you can grow up through him. You can be raised again, as it were. You can be born again. And what I realized was what had saved me was not the Freudian ideas, which turned out to be untrue, but it was the love that had developed, the mentor love that, had, that I had developed for this therapist. And I realized that he was representing something beyond himself because he too was just a flawed individual. The only time I ever surprised him, the only time I ever said anything that actually took him aback was when I came in and told him I'd been baptized. His jaw actually dropped because he was still operating under theories that I had discarded where I realized that he had represented something that was greater than myself. So now, so that's how I came to the, the ideas that I was uh, kind of talking about before and through reading Milton's Paradise Lost, which basically expounds on those ideas, how the rebellion against a king is different than the rebellion against the king of heaven and earth. So these are the things that we've been talking about for the last uh, three weeks or so and kind of looking at them in terms of what the news of the day was. But I've kind of also moved on. It's been a long time since that terrible period in my life, which was the bottom of my life uh, uh, up, till, up till this moment, talking to you. No, <laughs> it was the bottom of my life from which it, I have really increased in joy and it's been a, a beautiful, beautiful experience. But now I, as I look back, and I addressed this a little last week, I realized that my life was not really in my control, that all of it has been authored by the source of that love. I, that my entire life is a God-made thing. I am a God-made man. I am an object, an art, an object of art that was made by an artist who is not myself. And I think we all know this, and we all know that we are supposed to be something, right? We're supposed to be something that we aren't. We are supposed to be something more on. We all know this, and we, those of us who are uh, unwilling to face it become virtue signalers because they, we want to say, well, we really are the virtuous person. It's you. It's that guy down there. It's Abraham Lincoln. It's that statue over there. Those are the evildoers instead of acknowledging that we fall short. This is one of the reasons that I make this joke about the mailbag every week, that it'll change your life. But will it change your life for the better? And the reason I make that joke, I've explained it before, but it's worth explaining again. I know explaining a joke kills it, but still. The reason I make that joke is because we all know our lives need to change. Go to the most famous movie star in the world who has all the babes and all the money and all the fame he wants and say to him, hey, read this book. It's going to change your life. He'll read the book. And you'll think, well, why? You know, Why does Brad Pitt need to change his life? Why does Tom Cruise need to change his life? And you will find, yes, even they know that they have to change their lives. That's why Tom Cruise wanders around in that uh, ridiculous Scientology uh, mock How religion. How dare you? <laughs> yeah. No, he, he does. Uh, he, he's in that you know mock religion because he knows that he's not what he's supposed to be. So th this leads us to the question of identity, and that, that the reason I want to talk about this is because almost everything that we're talking about is about identity. Last week we were talking about that little Nas X uh, video in which he went and uh, worshipped Satan and was sodomized by Satan and finally became himself satanic. And it begins with saying, you know, you, you in the world, you can't express yourself, but I express myself. And I pointed out that he's right. If you express yourself as you desire yourself to be, you will ultimately end up in hell. You will ultimately end up uh, with Satan and being satanic yourself. 
So, what, but what is your identity? Because your identity is not what everybody tells you it is. It's not just being a patriot. It's not just being, uh, you know, an American. It's not just being anything. It is something essential to yourself that you were born on as that you were made. And one of the mistakes that Christians make is they think that they're supposed to be unselfish, that they're not supposed to worry about their own good. That's not true. You, of course, everybody worries about his own good. You're just supposed to know where your good is and maybe your good is not uh, where you thought it was. And so you're looking for something that you were made. You were looking to become what you were made. You're looking to do it without envy, without trying to beat somebody else. You don't need actual competition. You just need to grow toward the light of the thing that made you. And I want to take a look at that, the look at what, what that means in the political world and in our cultural, these cultural wars that we're having, where the left is really on the march. The left really has an idea of what your identity is. It's a little confused. It's a little weird that they don't believe in, you know, the spirit. But suddenly, if you, you want to turn from a man to a woman, you can spiritually do that and transform your body. They're a little confused about it, but they know. They know what they are, and they're very aggressive. And we are put in this position that G.K. Chesterton was talking about, with, that when they question what identity is, we turn identity into a cult. So I want to start with this with an, a mistake that I think a lot of people make, which is the mistake between feelings and axioms, okay? And somebody who made this mistake, I think, was Ayn Rand. I know a lot of people on our side like Ayn Rand, but uh, I'm not a fan. I'm not a fan. I think she says some true things. She, in some ways, she makes prophecies. You know, she she saw the kind of socialist disillusion of our freedom coming years and years ago, and I, she did that because she understands money. She really understood how money works and how power works, and all these uh, and all those things that went into that. But she says something. I found an old interview that she did with Mike Wallace, the father of Chris Wallace, and it, it was kind of touching because I. I I could see the truth that she was getting at, but I could also see that she was wrong, okay? And I'll show you why I think she was wrong. She talks about her morality and how she developed her idea of morality. This cut nine. My morality is based on man's life as a standard of value. And since man's mind is his basic means of survival, I hold that if man wants to live on earth and to live as a human being, he has to hold reason as an absolute, by which I mean that he has to hold reason as his only guide to action and that he must live by the independent judgment of his own mind, that his highest moral purpose is the achievement of his own happiness and that he must not force other people nor accept their right to force him that each man must live as an end in himself and follow his own rational self-interest. All right, so that's, you know, she's attacking Christianity. She goes on to openly attack Christianity because she feels it denies the self, which I don't, I don't think is right. You know, Christ said you lose yourself in order to find yourself. He was not saying that you cease to be a self. He was saying that yourself is other than what you think it is, other than uh, your own immediate happiness or your own desires. Now, she talks about reason as an absolute, and this is where I go after her. She says reason is an absolute. It is our only guide to moral action. And Mike Wallace says, well, you know, a lot of these things you hate, these kind of socialistic measures that you hate were voted in by the majority, were voted in democratically. What's the problem with that? And here's a response, cut 10. I object to the idea that people have the right to vote on everything. The traditional American system was a system based on the idea that majority will prevailed only in public or political affairs and that it was limited by inalienable individual rights. Uh Therefore, I do not believe that a majority can vote a man's life or property or freedom away from him. The inalienable rights are self-evident truths. They are not. They are not products of reason. They are products of perception. They are not products of feelings. This is the thing. Because, see, the left thinks because they can't be proved. That's what an axiom is. It's an unprovable truth on which all other truths are based. That's what an axiom is. And it's, and it's self-evident. We can see it. But it's not. doesn't make it obvious. It may take hundreds and hundreds of years to see it. But once you see it, you realize that it's obvious. But it's not based on reason. It is based on the human person, on the human ability to experience the world as it is, or at least 
coherently, to experience the world coherently. Now, what the left says is, well, we can get rid of those axioms. They say those are fictions. Those are stories that are being told by the powerful to keep people in place. Even freedom of speech, they say now, is just a trick. It's a trick devised by the powerful to let people say evil things about uh, minorities and therefore keep them in their place. But no, in fact, What we trust is that we trust that the human being is a God-made instrument for perceiving moral reality. And it begins with axioms, and then reason takes place. No system is closed. No system can prove itself. This is is an actual mathematical theorem. No system can prove itself, including the system of reason, including the system of logic. We always have to remember the French Revolution was actually an act of reason, of pure reason. And as G.K. Chesterton has said, the madman hasn't lost his reason. He's lost everything else. He has become completely reasonable. He has become Ayn Rand. And so when Jesus says, give unto Caesar what is Caesar's and give unto God what is God's, we all know, I think we all understand that what he is saying is you belong to God and you cannot give you to Caesar. And so what I want to talk about when we talk about politics, I want to start to say, well, what is the identity that we believe in? It's not just the cult of identity that we put forward because they say identity is a false consciousness. They say it's a false consciousness and we have to say, no, no, it's real. And as G.K. Chesterton said, that becomes our cult. I want to explore the very, very complicated idea of what the individual is. And I'm going to talk about the news, where that's where we're going to talk about the headlines, but I just want to think about what it is we're fighting for and who it is we're fighting for. Who is this individual whose freedom we want to protect? I love watches. I really do. I love timepieces of all kinds, but I don't want to pay a zillion dollars for them. That's why I love my Vincero watch. When you pick up a Vincero product, you immediately know that you got more than you paid for. It is great value for your money guaranteed. They offer a five-year warranty and a 365-day return policy because they stand behind every product they make. And right now is the perfect time to shop Vincero because right now is Vincero's spring upgrade sale. They have what you need to upgrade your style for the spring and they take up to 30% off on all of their brand new watches and accessories and get ready to hit this spring and summer feeling like a new person at a great price. Head over to Vincero, V-I-N, C-E-R-O collective.com forward slash Claven. No code is required. Your discount will be automatically applied at checkout, but only if you access the sale by going to Vincero collective.com slash Claven. Everything on site is up to 30% off. No exclusions, including sunglasses, wallets, and bracelets. Go to my link and check out this awesome sale going at Vincero. I spelled Vincero, but I didn't spell Claven. I know it's K-L-A-V-A-N. There are no E's. No Claven. President Biden in a 3-2 count. Here's the pitch. Swing and a miss. And he's not getting up. (laughs) You know, the reason the, the question of the individual has become so important, as obviously, is it is he who is under attack. And there are a lot of assaults on individual rights. And when Uh, You know, that Chesterton quote is really to the moment because suddenly those rights, which we all thought were self-evident, right, which is in our uh, Declaration of Independence, that these are self-evident rights, suddenly we're being told, no, you know, they're they're not self-evident. They're not. It's not at all what uh, what you should take for granted at all. And the way this is coming clear is the the combination, almost conspiratorial combination of big government with big business and with big media as well. And you can throw in a lot of other things like the intelligence community, although that's part of uh, the government and, and uh, certainly the academy. And so we have to talk, we have to talk about this concept. They're calling it woke capital. And, and that's, that's a pretty good term. The, the idea that the power of business should be put to use for social justice instead of enlightened profits. Right? There's nothing wrong with a company simply dedicating itself to making profits in an honest way. Now, one of the things is we used to just assume that we were going to be honest, that our companies were going to be honest or held to account. But because of Ayn Rand and other people sort of talking about profits as if they were a good in and of themselves, we started to lose the idea that underneath our capitalism has to be a value system that is based on you know, our Christian upbringing and our Christian background. Without that, capitalism can become just as evil and just as 
uh, oppressive as anything else. And I think that's exactly what's happening. I think what we're getting is blowback from the right wing's elevation of business above the underlying morals and interests uh, that have to govern all of us. So the thing about woke capital, the thing about business combining with government is who do they bully? They, not ju- they don't just bully individuals, their employees, but they bully elected officials, right? The people who are responsible to us are now under fire from businesses to do political, to take political acts that the businesses think it will be good for them to take. And I want to take a look at this because, you know, I, I've said before that the two stupidest people, the two most foolish people, let's not call them stupid, the two most foolish people are in America are the right winger who says that it is all right for private entities to destroy our rights because they're not the government, they're private, so nobody can stop them. Or they think it's even worse for the government to stop them from destroying our rights than it is for them to destroy our rights. And the leftist who thinks his rights aren't being destroyed, he is also a fool. If he sees, you know, Alex Jones or Steve Crowder being thrown off YouTube and uh, and all the other social media platforms, he thinks, well, it's the right, it's not me. But they'll, they'll come for him eventually. It's his rights. When the rights disappear, they are your rights too. We all have the same rights. When somebody loses them, that we've all lost them a little bit. So that's a, that's another kind of foolishness. Right now, people are are cheering for the Democrats. People are becoming Democrats. A late a Gallup poll shows that the Democrats now have something like a 9% advantage in identity. 49% identify as Democrats. Only 40% identify as Republicans. They've had bigger advantages before. But this, I think it's Trump. Trump alienated a lot of people. And I think that's showing up in this poll. But at the same time, something interesting is happening, which is that Republicans, a lot of Republicans are doing great in fundraising. And the fundraising is coming from individuals and they're getting lots and lots of money. The House uh, Minority Leader uh, McCarthy, he's getting tons and tons of cash and he's getting them from individual people. So what's happening is the alignment that is going on is not really an alignment between left and right. It's an alignment between power and the individual. Because remember, remember, fascism yeah, well, let's let's listen to our old friend Ronald Reagan. Ronald Reagan had an excellent definition of fascism, and this is the truth. This is cut one. You know, someone very profoundly once said many years ago that if fascism ever comes to America, it'll come in the name of liberalism. And what is fascism? Fascism is private ownership, private enterprise, but total government control and regulation. Well, isn't this the liberal philosophy? The conservative, so-called, is the one that says less government, get off my back, get out of my pocket. And let me have more control of my own destiny. So he's he's pointing out that business in and of itself is not a good if it's being controlled by government or if it is in collusion, which is happening now with government. And that's fascism. We're not fighting leftism. We're not fighting communism here. I keep calling it Chinese uh, communism because Chinese communism isn't communism. We're fighting fascism and we're fighting power. We're fighting for individual rights. So because we have come to the end of something, because we've come to the end of the post-World War II consensus, that it always, at the end of a cycle, it always divides not into left and right, but into the powerful against the individual. Always, every single time, that is who the fight is going to be between. So last week, I showed you a one minute and 15 second clip of Joe Biden lying about Georgia's attempt to reform its electoral processes. There's nothing to, it's not against black people. It's not about anybody. It is simply re- reforming its processes so people have trust in the electoral system after an election that was damaged very badly by the lockdown and the pandemic and people getting away with stuff they shouldn't have gotten away with. So Texas is doing it now. Georgia is doing it now. Joe Biden called this Jim Crow on steroids a stone lie. It was just a lie. And he lied straight for a minute and 15 seconds in his description of what was in the Georgia bill. And the uh, Major League Baseball reacted by withdrawing the all-star game from Atlanta, depriving small businesses in a largely black city uh, and taking the, moving the all-star game to Denver, which is a largely white city. Now, the media, remember now, now the main, what we call the mainstream media, which is really corporate media, it is big business, the same big business that the Major League Baseball is big business. The media is big business. This is all big business fighting against the rights of the individual, right? At first, NBC, for instance, reported this with great sympathy. Now, this is cut 27. This is not 26, it's 27. 
This summer's All-Star Game has a new home. The MLB announced the game will be played in Denver after moving it out of Atlanta in protest of Georgia's GOP-backed new law restricting voting rights. Many Republicans have blasted the decision. Today, President Biden told Georgia and other states looking to pass similar laws to, quote, smarten up. Okay, so that's a very pro-Biden, pro-MLB uh, report. It's slanted, smarten up, you stupid Georgians, you know, you crackers who are out there trying to stop black people from voting. Now, NBC finds that, oh, there are certain unintended consequences of this kind of virtue signaling, which because it has no moral basis at all. It has no basis in truth. It has no basis in morality. But we'll get to that in a minute. Suddenly they find that there are, as we say, quote unquote, unintended consequences. This is NBC reporting cut 26. After months of seeing his sales stunted by the pandemic, Sean Cooper thought All-Star Weekend was his chance to make up ground. Just in this one weekend, over 20,000. 20,000? Yes. That's more than double what you normally see on a weekend. Way, way, yes, way more than double. His restaurant sits in the shadow of Truist Park, home of the Atlanta Braves, and until last week, home of this year's All-Star Game. Now he's among dozens of disappointed businesses facing financial loss with MLB moving the game out of Georgia, taking a stand over the state's new voting law and taking tens of millions of dollars in tourist revenue. The game is now headed west to Denver and critics point out to a city with a very different demographic. Black people comprise more than half of Atlanta's population. In Denver, it's less than 10%. It's the unintended consequence of taking a stand. It draws more <laughs> eyes and attention to the conversation, but the trade-off, what gets lost in the shuffle, are these businesses who are desperate for more revenue. There's no trade-off. It's making a statement. It's making a statement, but it's destroying the people it's supposed to help, okay? It's making a statement. So remember this, okay? Because I, I'm, the point I'm trying to make here is this is not a, t a fight with the left because many on the left will agree with us. They're making a statement, but they're destroying the people they're supposed to help. So the point then, the only point, can be the statement. What is the point of the statement, right? Let's t turn to a leftist writer, a woman named Helen Lewis at The Atlantic. She's very far left. I disagree with her on many, many things. But the thing about true leftists, honest leftists, is they're trying to accomplish the same things as good people on the right. We're all trying to help people, right? We're all trying to make li life better for people. We disagree with the left on what the path to that is. We think that the leftism is slavery. We th I think that far rightism, that fascism is also slavery. But we, are, we do have a lot of the same goals in mind. I just think they're mistaken. Helen Lewis at The Atlantic goes after woke capital. Here's what she says. She says, a writer, John Schwartz, once described the iron law of institutions under which people with seniority inside an institution care more about preserving their power within the institution than they do about the power of the institution as a whole. So in other words, it, a CEO is trying to protect his position, not the position of the company. That self-preservation instinct also operates when private companies struggle to acclimat acclimatize to life in a world where many consumers vocally support social justice causes. And she care calls this the iron law of woke capitalism. Brands will gravitate toward low-cost, high-noise signals as a substitute for genuine reform to ensure their survival. Those with power inside institutions love splashy, progressive gestures, solemn, monochrome, social media posts deploring racism, appointing their first woman to the board, firing low-level employees who attract online fury because they help preserve their power. Those at the top who are disproportionately white, male, wealthy, and highly educated are not being asked to give up anything themselves. And Marco Rubio made this point by going after the, uh, the head of Major League Baseball and asking him, Robert Manfred, asking him, have you quit uh, Augusta, the golf course, which is also in Atlanta, is CBS not going to broadcast the Masters? Of course they are. They're not going to lose that money. No one is paying any price whatsoever. Coke and Delta, we talked about this last week, Coke and Delta, both of which are located in Atlanta, have both attacked Georgia for this. But Delta on their website calls themselves the most Chinese-friendly U.S. airline. China is leading the way in international growth, and Delta is committed to being the most Chinese-friendly U.S. airline. 
right? And Coca-Cola invested $4 billion in China for future growth. Now, China, you know, we know is not just putting Uyghurs in concentration camps. China is attempting to brainwash Christians, according to a new report, by holding them in mobile transformation facilities. Mobile transformation facilities. Radio Free Asia related, relayed stories last week from a man given the pseudonym Li Yuiz, who said he was beaten in a windowless room for 10 months. What was his crime? He was a Christian. He was detained after authorities raided his house church in 2018. There were no windows, no ventilation, no time allowed outside, said Lee. I was given just two meals a day, which were brought to the room by a designated person. Authorities threatened him, insulted him, intimidated him. These were United Front officials, men, women, sometimes on night. These are the these are the people with whom Coke and Delta and Apple, who is also attacking Georgia, are all working, okay? Now, the effect of this is real, right? We saw Christy Nome, the South Dakota governor who I really liked during the pandemic. We saw her bow down to pressure from the NCAA and Amazon to essentially gut and veto a bill that would have protected girls' sports from boys pretending to be girls or thinking themselves girls or declaring themselves girls in order to wipe girls' sports off the map. We saw her uh, cave into that. We saw a genuinely disgusting display of Asa Hush Hutchinson in Arkansas who vetoed a bill banning what is essentially the chemical castration of minors transitioning for young people. Tucker uh, Carlson had him on and Asa made his case. This is cut two. First of all, you have parents involved in very difficult decisions. You have physicians that are involved in these decisions. And uh, I go back to William Buckley, I go back to Ronald Reagan, the principles of our party, uh, which believes in a limited role of government. Are we as a party abandoning a limited role of government and saying we're going to invoke the government decision making over and above physicians, over and above health care, over and above parents? <laughs> yeah, Ronald Reagan would have loved the chemical castration of children. He was really into that. No, this guy is caving in to financial interests. He's caving into financial interests. And, and uh, this, this is woke capital, big business, colluding with government, colluding with other corporations, corporate interests like the media to take away the power from elected officials, which is the only real political power the people have, which is to elect its officials. We elect the officials. They lose their power when government goes after them. It is fascism, as Reagan said. Here's Dan Crenshaw making the same point. Cut five. This is what I call the phenomenon that, that's going on. It's, it's progressive fascism. Because what is fascism? Well, it's the, it's, the, it's the regimentation of the economy, of society, and it's the forced suppression of, of your opposition. That's what's happening right now. The Democrats have successfully um, captivated the institutions, you know, pop culture, Hollywood, our education institutions, and now our corporations into their own woke agenda. This is fascism, right? And they use cancel culture as, as a tool to impose their fascism on us. And so, so they're always using this, this anti-fascist anti labeling against the right, but they're the ones who actually engage in the tactics. And it's time we expose that. That's really what's happening here. And, and we should see it for what it is. Absolutely right. So the question is, how do we fight back? Whenever I'm lying awake at night, which is whenever it's night, I like to be able to check on my house using ring doorbells and ring cameras, ring security systems. They are inexpensive and they're effective. And it's a perfect time to upgrade your doorstep with a ring video doorbell. With ring, you can see and speak to whoever is at your door from anywhere right on your phone. Whether you're at home or whether you're far away, you'll never miss a visitor, your neighbor, your dinner, your groceries, and you can keep those packages and deliveries safe from those bandits. With motion detection, you'll get notified even if they don't ring the doorbell. If someone stops by or something's going on, Ring lets you know. Right now, get a special offer on the Ring Welcome Kit at ring.com slash Clavin. It comes with Ring's Video Doorbell 3 and Chime Pro. It's the perfect way to upgrade your front door and start your Ring experience. So go to ring.com slash Clavin. That's ring.com slash Clavin. Anyone comes to your door, no matter where you are, you can ask him, how do you spell Clavin? If he says K-L-A-V-A-N, call the cops. Guys, our militia is not well regulated. It says right there we can regulate guns. <laughs> uh, you know, fighting back, when we talk about fighting back, it's always going to be, you keep hearing people say, well, we've got to fight back on the local level, or you hear about the Benedict Option where we're supposed to form our own communities and it's going to be personal, uh, personal activity. The reason for that 
The reason for that is because the fight is between the little guy, us, the small guy, the individual, and these collected colluding powers. So of course it's going to be local. Of course it's going to have to uh, do with what people do in their states, with what people do in their towns, and what people do in their families, and the way they behave, and what people do in their businesses. So it's all going to be, those are all the things that are going to take place. And that's why the left is always against, why are they against small businesses? Why do they pr- pass minimum wage laws that, that damage small businesses? They don't care about small businesses. It's much easier for them to negotiate between a union and Amazon than it is for them to negotiate with a lot of little companies that can't afford to pay their employees union wages, right? It's much, much easier for them to deal with big business and big business colludes with them and gives them this power. So it's always the little guy. It's always the little guy who's going to have to be in the fight. But of course, we have to use what political power we have. For instance, I mean, Joe Biden just made this thing. You remember Joe Biden. He's that kind of doddering old clown. He's like a houseplant, but he's like president. Of the United, you know, don't ask me, but he's also president of the United States. Uh, he made this uh, attack on gun rights. And again, he just stood up and lied. He, he did what he did. He stood up and lied, saying that you sh- could go to a gun show and get a gun without a permit. And it was the famous permit loophole, which doesn't exist. Most of the salesmen at gun shows are federally regulated and federally licensed and so federally regulated. And you have to get a permit. If you have a private sale between individual and individual, then you don't need a gun permit because that's how are you going to control that? I, sh- I should be able to sell a gun to a friend or give a gun to a friend without his getting a permit from me, without his me having to check him out. I mean, that's the point. And that's what he's trying to get rid of with an executive order. And he made this absolutely stunning comment about the Second Amendment. I think this is cut uh, 28. Nothing, nothing I'm about to recommend in any way impinges on the Second Amendment. They're phony arguments suggesting that these are Second Amendment rights at stake from what we're talking about. But no amendment, no amendment to the Constitution is absolute. You can't yell crowd, you can't yell fire in a crowded movie theater. We call it freedom of speech. From the very beginning, you couldn't own any weapon you wanted to own. From the very beginning of the Second Amendment existed, certain people weren't allowed to have weapons. So the idea is just bizarre to suggest that some of the things we're recommending are contrary to the Constitution. (laughs) Black people weren't allowed to have weapons. Why do you think? Because they didn't want them to be free. They didn't want black people to be free. So when he says certain people weren't allowed to have weapons, that's why. That is why. The, The right to bear arms, as I've said repeatedly, was included so that states could fight back against the federal government. That's why it's there. So they could, states could form militias to fight back against an overweening federal government. And that's what we see in Texas, for instance, where Greg Abbott is pushing legislation that will make the state a gun sanctuary state. And you're going to see this in red states. You're going to see red states refusing to comply. You're going to see legal action taken against these executive orders going to court and saying uh, the Supreme Court right now has two gun cases that it's deciding whether to take. And that's where you're going to see pushback coming. You're going to see pushback coming from individuals who aren't going to register their guns. Uh, I think it was the Babylon Bee said AK-15s have suddenly all disappeared uh, in a in a tragic boat accident or something like that. And that, so you're going to see that kind of thing. And that's where, that is where the fight back is going to come. Donald Trump, you know, one of the reasons we, we liked Donald Trump is because he understood that these were the fights. And unlike Asa Hutchinson and unlike Christy Nome, he understood that these are the fights that have to be fought. And he reacted to the Major League Baseball calling for a, bo- a boycott. There's a cut three. Frankly, if Republican conservatives ever got their act together, which they should, mm-hmm. uh, if we had some real leadership instead of Mitch McConnell and the group, if we had some real leadership, what you'd be doing is something much different. They'd be boycotting these companies and those companies would be coming. That's what the liberals do. Mm -hmm. They boycott anybody that speaks out, they boycott them. They cancel them and they boycott them. We have more people than they do. So what should happen is the Republicans and let's say Republican conservatives, Republicans, you could call it whatever you want, the right, if they would boycott these companies that are so uh, above it all, Mm -hmm. you'd find that they would come back into the fold very quickly. But right now, uh, the liberals, the radical left, plays a much to the Democrats. They play a much tougher game. 
You know, this is this is the thing. He's he's right about this. If you're going to boycott, it's got to be organized boycotts. I mean, I stopped watching NFL football, but what difference does that make, right? You know, I I, I miss it. I want to watch it. Uh, and I think if there were an organized boycott, that would be helpful, an organized thing. But the more important thing about Trump is he understands that this is where the battle is. Christy Nome did not understand that when she came to Amazon. And then the people came after her, and now she has put out. I mean, this is the thing. You do have... See, <laughs> They came after Christy Nome, and she put out executive actions to protect, to do essentially what this law was going to do. Now, whether those executive actions would be any more useful, I don't know. But at least she had to make the effort. Why? Because she's answerable to the voters. She is more answerable to the voters than she is to Amazon. And that's why when Amazon fights Christy Nome, when Amazon threatens Christy Nome, she's taking power away from you because your power is the vote. When MLB says they're protecting voting rights by pulling out of Atlanta, they're actually taking power away from the voters because they're causing politicians to react to their money, to their power, to their virtue signaling, and to their brand making instead of to the vote, right? And so it's the vote that strikes back. And when people argued with Christy Noem, she she got online and she said she passed executive actions to do the things that uh, that she refused to do in the law. You know, uh, the Daily Wire took a poll. We commissioned a national poll from SurveyMonkey and found out that a strong majority of Americans believe that corporations and sports teams should generally stay out of politics. Uh, Americans are about evenly divided on the Major League Baseball's decision in the new Georgia law. But but when they found out what was in the Georgia law, right, they were they those uh, the things that were protecting the vote were actually very popular. So we have that power, and Trump is right that we have that power. And people like Christy Noem should be playing into that power. Asa Hutchinson, Trump heard about Asa Hutchinson, and he said he's done, he's finished. Uh, and Sarah Huckabee uh, Sanders will probably be the one to go after him. Even more hopeful, and there, these are really hopeful things because it always takes it always takes the individual a minute to understand that the verities have been questioned, that the simple truths of their freedoms have been questioned. It always takes a minute for them to gather their strength, and the left is on the, always on the rampage. They're like the devil. They're prowling around like a lion looking for a chance to get their victims. It always takes the right a little bit of time to organize. One of the more hopeful things that happened this week, and a lot of hopeful little signs started to flash up, was Clarence Thomas. Clarence Thomas, uh, the, the Supreme Court vacated a 2019 appeals court ruling that said then-President Donald Trump violated the First Amendment by blocking people on Twitter, right? That had gone to the Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court said that case is moot because Trump is no longer president. But the argument in that case was that Trump's Twitter feed was a public forum. And Clarence Thomas agreed that the case was moot, but wrote a 12-page uh, concurrence in which he said, well, wait a minute, if President Trump's Twitter feed is a public forum, how does Twitter then have the right to shut that forum down? He said, because of the change in presidential administration, the court correctly vacates the Second Circuit's d decision. I write separately to note that this petition highlights the principal legal difficulty that surrounds digital platforms, namely that applying old doctrines to new digital platforms is rarely straightforward. Respondents, the Twitter users who sued Trump, have a point, for example, that some aspects of Mr. Trump's account resemble a constitutionally protected public forum, but it seems rather odd to say that something is a government forum when a private company has unrestricted authority to do away with it, right? And he says, we're going to have to decide that case eventually. Stephen Miller has started America First Legal Foundation, which is supposed to be the right wing version of the ACLU. Let him describe it. Cut six. This is the conservative response to the ACLU. Being a senior official in the Trump administration, I saw firsthand for four years how the radical left waged legal warfare against the president. You talked about border security. We faced dozens of lawsuits for every single action that we took to secure the southern border of the United States. We faced lawsuits on every area of policy, energy policy, climate policy, environmental policy, abortion policy, everything. We are badly outmanned, badly outmaneuvered, and my organization, America First Legal, is here to finally even the score. I'm not a lawyer, and that's the point. I'm a policy guy who saw firsthand how the ACLU and other organizations were able to delay our policies being put into place. And conservatives need to have a legal organization to answer that. And that's why I'm doing this. For me, it's really smart. I've said there should be a right-wing ACLU for years. The law, the states, 
the individual and individual action and concerted action are all the ways that we are starting to fight. The people are starting to fight back. We can win this fight because, because remember, we are not fighting the left. We're not fighting the left. We're fighting fascism. We're fighting the combination, the collusion of the great powers, business, government, media. We're fighting that empire of lies. And there will be people on the left who will join that fight. We may have to argue with them later, but on this, I think people will agree. They will come together to fight this. It's that each of us has to do it and each of us has to be involved. And we, of course, have to live out the meaning of our creed in our own personal lives, because that is possibly the greatest weapon we have being an individual. Now, some of you want to be comfortable in bed while you're asleep, you weaklings, people like me who stay up all night, get to enjoy our MyPillow every minute of the night. You've all heard me talk about MyPillow, and they now have My Slippers. These slippers took over two years to develop. They're designed to wear indoors or outdoors all day long. The My Slippers are made with MyPillow foam and impact gel to help prevent fatigue, and they're made with quality leather suede. I've got one coming on the way. I'm really looking forward to them. I actually do wear slippers. And for a limited time, MyPillow is offering 40% off their new My Slippers. Yes, 40% off. I have the sheets. I got the pillows. I'm waiting for those slippers. Go to MyPillow.com and click on the radio listener square and use promo code DAILYWIRE. You'll get deep discounts on all MyPillow products, including the Giza Dream bed sheets, the MyPillow mattress topper, and MyPillow towel sets. Or you can call 800-951-7163 and use promo code DAILYWIRE with them. Visit MyPillow.com now or call 800-951-7163. So, I want to start to talk about this really difficult, complicated question of identity and what an individual is and of what we are made and what is the God-made man. Very interesting little conflict this week between our pal Jordan Peterson and Ta-Nehisi Coates, who made him the villain of a uh, uh, Captain America comic he's writing. I'm going to get to that. I'm going to get to that because it really illustrates what I'm saying. But first, I just want to get into the subject and talk about why this is such a difficult question. Um, you know, I, 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 another story that is in one of my favorite stories that's in The Great Good Thing uh, is when I, I started to read the Gospels when I was 15 years old, and I did not read them with any eye toward belief. I read them because I understood I wanted to be a writer. I had started studying literature and reading literature, and I understood that the Gospels underscored and supported all of the great literature of the West. Even the atheist literature was basically founded on the Gospels, and the Gospels were what William Blake, the poet, called the great code of art. And so in order to understand uh, the great code of art, I wanted to to read the Gospels. So I was uh, a Jew, right? And we didn't have a New Testament in the house, so I went out and I found uh, one of those Bibles. I have it to this day. It is falling apart, but I've never let go of it. And I closed myself in my room and I started reading the gospel according to Luke. The reason I picked it is because it had the Christmas story in it. Uh, and, um, and my father walked in on me. He walked in on me and he caught me reading the gospel according to Luke. And he went nuts. He hit the roof. Now, I, I, I always joke about this. I always say I could have been reading pornography. The truth is, at 15, I was sexually active and could literally have been in, in bed with a girlfriend when my father walked in. But he walked in and caught me cat- reading the gospel according to Luke, and he was absolutely furious. And he, he stuck his finger in my face, and he told me that I ever thought of converting, he would disown me. And I, and I was saying, you know, I'm not reading it as a religious document. I'm reading it for the literary uh, feeling of it. But maybe he knew something I didn't since I eventually became a Christian. Well, the thing was, he felt that I was betraying my identity as a Jew, even though he wasn't really a great believer. uh, He believed in having the identity of a Jew because he had lived through the period. He hadn't lived through the Holocaust, but he lived through the period of the Holocaust. He had fought in World War II. and, uh, And he thought, he said to me, he said to me, you cannot stop being a Jew because people will still hate you. And I, being a smart ass teenager, replied, why would I let the people who hate me define me? Okay, which is a really, really good question. You know, it is a good question. Why should I let the people who hate me define me? And I do believe that that is what the black activists on the left have done. They have uh, adopted the ideas of the people who hated them, that there is something essential about their blackness, that there is something uh, essential about whiteness. And that's why you, I, I feel that the same 
racists on the right, you know, or if you call them on the right, the Ku Klux Klan style racists and the races at the New York Times are essentially the same people. One of them may be a toothless clown in a pool, ha- a pool hall and the other may be an Ivy League black woman, but they are espousing the same evil, wicked philosophy. So this is, and this for me is the problem with identity politics. When you become too much of an individualist, however, you also are kind of being dishonest because our identity is in part formed by the people around us. I'm an American. Uh, That was one of the reasons I think that Judaism seemed so alien to me. My heroes were Mickey Mantle. My heroes were John Glenn. I I didn't had no idea why I was going to Hebrew school and learning how to speak Hebrew since my parents didn't really believe in God. I had no idea what any of that was about. This is the big question of American life, which is the question of assimilation. So many, so many of our great works of art are really about assimilation. I've pointed this out before. I won't go into it. The Godfather is one. Get Out is one. I think uh, Hamilton is one. It's what happens when you become, when you attach your allegiance to an idea instead of to your blood. The old-fashioned conservatism of Europe is conservatism of blood and soil, right? It is, I am the, I am an Englishman because I am English by blood. I am an Englishman because I stand on English soil. I have to defend English soil from people who are not English. This was basically the argument of Hitler taken to the extreme. We have to defend the Aryan, pure Aryan blood of the Germans. Now, of course, on the, on the one hand, it's absurd because there is no such thing as uh, pure blood. But on the other hand, it is against Christianity. Christianity has another idea that you leave being a Jew or a Greek or a Gentile or or even a man or a woman to attach yourself to an idea and become part of that idea. But there is this thing that happens in assimilation and a thing that happens in that a struggle takes place inside the body of a person, right? There is the place you come from, in my case, being a Jew or being, you know, it could be being Italian, being a black person. And then there's the place that you wish to become a part of, America, the idea that all men are created equal, the idea that we have certain inalienable rights, that they were given to us by God. All of those things now are going to define you and how much of your blood, your essential Italianness, are you going to lose in going over to that place? And of course, what is forgotten, if we forget that we are God-made things, the third person is forgotten in between these two people is the person that God made, the person that God made you to be. I struggled before I converted to Christianity. I struggled a great deal with the idea was, was I this, my conversion just an act of assimilation? Was it an act of betrayal against my blood? I struggled with this a good deal, but ultimately I came to feel that the person I was made to be by God was attached to this truth, that that truth, the God who made me, was expressed by Christianity. And there's a a question in the uh, mailbag today about why I think that's true, and I'll try to answer it. It It's a very, very difficult question, very complicated question, at least from my point of view. I always like doing these Raycon ads because I get to sing the Raycon song, Raycon, which comes on every time and lets me know that I am wearing a great, attractive pair of ear pods that I can listen to my audiobooks on. You probably listen to your crummy music on them, but I'm listening to audiobooks as I go out there and hike. Raycons can make all the difference. There are no dangling wires or stems to get in your way. They come in a range of stylish colors, and they always have a comfortable in-ear fit for a more discreet look. Raycons are built to perform anywhere and anytime. They have water and sweat-resistant construction, which, believe me, is useful for me, and Bluetooth pairs quickly and seamlessly with enough battery life for six hours of playtime. Raycons offering 15% of all their products for my listeners. Here's what you got to do. Go to buyraycon.com com slash Clavin. That's B U Y Raycon.com slash Clavin, and you will get 15% off your entire Raycon order. Feel free to grab a pair and a spare. That's 15% off at buyraycon.com slash Clavin. Buyraycon.com slash Clavin. And you're saying buy three letters. I know how to spell buy. How do you spell Clavin? <laughs> I didn't know that. So Here's the thing. What, how do we deal with collective responsibility, the collective responsibility of Americans and our individuality? How do we deal with the collective experience of being a black person or a Jewish person or an Italian person and our individual, 
individuality. And this is where Ta-Nehisi Coates comes in. Because the God-made man is a new man. He has a soul of his own. He is essentially given the task of starting the world again. And in fact, what Jesus says to us in his crucifixion is that you are now free. You are now free of the sins of history. You now have to only walk in the truths of eternity. That is what it means to live in the spirit instead of the flesh. And that's why the left, which is materialist, is always trying to drag us back down into the sins of of history. They want to keep us there in the sins of history. We want to be free into the truths of eternity. That is exactly what's going on. And this is, you know, the right does it too. And, you know, the right, right now the left is triumphant, the, life, the left is dominant, but the right does it too. As I like to say, you can leave the Christian building by either door. You can go out of the Christian building either way, and it doesn't matter which way you are. So as, a, as an American, as an American, I feel a special responsibility to black Americans to not participate in the bigotry that was part of American history. Blacks are required to take an extra step of grace to assimilate, right? Because most of us came here, including the pilgrims, came here to escape oppression elsewhere. They were brought here oppressed and they were oppressed in this country. So we are asking them to take an extra step of grace to assimilate as we have assimilated coming here from elsewhere. We, I, I feel as an American, I have to respect that we are asking of them that extra step of grace. As an individual, I bear no guilt for their oppression. I don't owe them any money. I don't owe them any favoritism. I don't owe them a single thing. I respect what they are doing. I respect what a black person is doing when he assimilates. I respect, respect that he's taking an extra step I didn't have to take, although I did have to take a step, but I respect that they're taking a different kind of step. But I, owe, I bear no, no responsibility as an individual for their past. And the fact is, I have no power to fix their past. And that's why Ta-Nehisi Coates, who is not a great thinker, he's a, he's a, can be an eloquent person, and I've heard that he's a decent person, but I don't think he's a great thinker. He went before Congress and he testified why he thought there should be reparations. And the answer against, the argument against reparations is, hey, we didn't do anything and you didn't suffer what was done. Why should we, our money, go to you? And I agree with that argument. I think that argument is right because we are individuals. We are each given a soul of his own with which to start the world again. I do not owe anybody for something that, did not, that I did not do and did not happen to them, right? If I lived in Germany and the survivors of the Holocaust were still alive, that would be different. Then I would say in my uh, identity as a German, I want those people who actually suffered at the hands of my country to be repaid. But now we're talking about generations and his argument as well, the effects are still being felt. That's true of everybody. That's true of everything. That does not make blacks special in any way. So here's his argument and listen closely to the way he confuses the two identities. Well into this century, the United States was still paying out pensions to the heirs of Civil War soldiers. We honor treaties that date back some 200 years, despite no one being alive, who signed those treaties. Many of us would love to be taxed for the things we are solely and individually responsible for. But we are American citizens, and thus bound to a collective enterprise that extends beyond our individual and personal reach. It would seem ridiculous to dispute invocations of the founders or the greatest generation on the basis of a lack of membership in either group. We recognize our lineage as a generational trust, as inheritance. And the real dilemma posed by reparations is just that, a dilemma of inheritance. But we do not inherit the sins of our fathers. We do not inherit the hurts of our fathers, even though each, you know, it is the great conflict of identity. This is the great conflict of identity. Every sin weaves itself into the fabric of history and can never be removed. but each person is born with a soul of his own with which to start the world again. Those two things are both true. That is, that is the key to Christianity in a lot of ways. The sin that you're released from is the sin of the world. Christ said, in the world you will have trouble because all those sins are baked into history, but I have overcome the world by opening up a door into eternal truth and into the spirit. And that is why we walk away from the evils of the past. We walk away from the bigotry of the past. We walk away from Jim Crow. We walk away from slavery and bigotry, but we can't fix the past. We do not have that power. And so we all have to walk away together. And he's confusing the two identities. And that's what made it so interesting that he's going after Jordan Peterson, who is the priest of 
personal responsibility. He is the priest of meaning. He says, live in meaning, not in happiness. Go after ha- uh, meaning, not happiness. That's great advice. And Jordan Peterson has been a powerful, powerful force, especially for young men who are lost in meaningless pursuits of pleasure and happiness. And that is a uh, something that is very addictive for young men. Having been a young man, I can testify to it. And Jordan Peterson has said, no, take responsibility for yourself, live into meaning, be respect respect the women you are with, pet a cat when you go by, <laughs> you know, take responsibility for the life you're living. So Don Isikos is writing Captain America. Why? I don't know. And he makes this guy Red Skull, who's a Nazi representative. <laughs> Nazi, he's a Nazi supervillain. He's a Nazi supervillain. He turns him in to Jordan Peterson. And he's got a little, I, I guess you can see it on the screen. He's got chaos and order. And these are the rules of life and all this stuff. <laughs> And so Jordan Peterson, I love this, this Canadian psychologist is suddenly Red Skull, the evil Nazi guy. And Captain America, who I think is gay now, right? Didn't he get gay? I don't know. I can't keep track of Marvel's desperate attempts to be uh, virtuous. But but Captain America says, these are weak men who are following Red Skill. They're looking for something to believe in. And he says, I found the flag to believe in. And he's talking to a cop. He says, you found the badge. But he tells them they're secretly great and they need something to fight against. And that's what they do. This is like I was talking about V for Vendetta, right? There's not, it's not that it's untrue. It's that he's a transposition of values because it's Ta-Nehisi Coates who has attached himself to his skin color, who, to his skin color to find meaning. And Jordan, who is saying, no, find meaning in personal responsibility. <laughs> it is actually, Tony Sikos is not just lying to the, the Captain America audience. I don't think he is lying to the Captain America audience. I think he's lying to himself. He starts off one of his books, I think it is, uh, I can't remember the name of it, but he starts it off by telling his son that the people hate, that people hate him, that people want to destroy his body. A terrible thing to say to a young man, especially in a country in America, where it's not actually true. He is the one, he is the one who has not distinguished between his responsibilities to history and his responsibilities to a a general identity and his more important responsibilities to himself and his truth. You know, Jordan, I think, I'm hoping Jordan will come on the show and talk about this. I I think he's kind of uh, starting to understand that there is, that in fact, this personal self that he feels uh, one should live into is actually a made thing. And I think that that is what we all have to understand because without that, we have no logic. We're just simply just pounding our fists in our palms and crying the individual, the individual. Until we understand where that individual comes from and how we establish who he is above our desires, above our pleasures, above our race, above even our nation, because the nations are just a drop in the bucket. Until we understand who that individual is, we're not going to understand what we're fighting for or how to fight back. Now, I know that many of you are sitting around thinking, gee, you know, I need a new Delphi FG1456 fuel pump assembly for my 2005 Honda Odyssey, and it costs like $354 at the big chain store. Well, here's an idea. <laughs> Why not go to rockauto.com, where you can not only get it for only 217 bucks, you get to say rockauto.com, rockauto. Women love when you do that. I'm telling, I can tell you from personal experience, they swoon. Women have forgotten how to swoon until you say rockauto.com, because not only does it sound cool, it means you know how to get car parts from your computer without driving your broken down car to a place and waiting online to talk to a guy who doesn't know any more than you do. So rockauto.com is attractive, not just because it sounds great, it also means you're a smarter person than you look. Go to rockauto.com right now and see all the parts available for your car or truck and write Clavin in there. How did you hear about us, Box? So they know we sent you. And please, when you say Clavin, you got to say Clavin the same way. Clavin and K-L-A-V-A-N. There are no E's. No E's in Clavin. We don't believe in E's. It's that exciting time of the week again. Candace Owens will be live streaming her new talk show, Candace, at 9 p.m. Eastern, 8 p.m. Central. In tonight's episode, Candace's Cancel Corner will feature Clay Travis, sports commentator and founder of Outkick Sports. He's the host of Outkick, the coverage on Fox Sports Radio, Outkick the Show live stream, and Wins and Losses podcast on iHeart. Clay has been canceled from CNN and ESPN for his upfront and sometimes in-your-face commentary, so naturally, he's a perfect guest for our Candace. Tune in to watch their hilarious discussion tonight at 9 p.m. Eastern, 8 p.m. Central, only on dailywire.com, and get 25% off a new membership with code CANDACE. The show streams on Fridays, 9 p.m. Eastern, 8 p.m. Central at dailywire.com, 
but you can get the audio podcast Candace on Apple, Spotify, or wherever you listen to your podcast. So if you need some Candace Owens in your podcast feed, and who doesn't, look no further. Head over to Apple Podcasts or Spotify and subscribe today, and be sure to leave a five-star review if you like what you hear. So I'm really thrilled to have this guest on today. Uh, The other day, Aaron Rodgers, Green Bay Packers quarterback, was hosting Jeopardy. They're looking for a replacement for the late Alex Trebek. And Rodgers said he knows what it's like to step into the footsteps of a legend. And he was referring to Brett Favre. Uh, Brett Favre is an NFL Hall of Famer, a Super Bowl champion, a three-time league MVP. He did it three years in a row. Uh, Now he's a podcaster, too. He's got a show, Bowling with Favre, is co-hosted by longtime media personality, financial analyst, and conservative commentator Eric Bowling, who is also with us. Uh, Here's the interview we did about sports and politics and just sports. Brett Favre and Eric Bowling, thank you so much for coming on. It is great to see you. I'm really thrilled to have you on. Thanks for having us. Hey, good, good, good to meet you, Andrew. Nice to see you. Yes. So we're we're dealing with a a, a week. The news of the week is uh, that the Major League Baseball has uh, pulled the All Star Game out of uh, Georgia and put it in uh, to Colorado. I, you know. Brett, you've been out of the game, I think it's 10 years since you retired. Uh, Correct. And are, are you surprised to see sports in general becoming this political? Yeah, and I think uh, both sides, uh, for the most part, want to see it just remain about the sport, not about politics. Um, at least that's my interpretation. I I know when I turn on a, a game, I want to watch a game. I want to watch players play and teams win and lose, uh, come from behind. I want to watch all the, you know, the important parts of the game, not what's going on outside of the game. And I think the, the general fan uh, feels the same way. You know, you were always known as a big locker room guy, a leader of men type. Uh, you played, uh, look, so many of the great American athletes are, are black guys. You played with some of the greats, Reggie White and Antonio Freeman and all this. When you were in the locker room, was this was there the kind of tension there now seems to be? I mean, a lot of the politics, as American politics always does, it revolves around race. Did you see that in the locker room when you were playing? Absolutely not. In fact, <laughs> that was sort of the... Um, our protected space, if you will, um, where where we could kind of let our guard down. Um, we were we were in something together. We fought together. We won together. We lost together. Um, and and we we truly were a family. Um, so yeah, to answer your question, we we absolutely didn't have issues that I. I I don't know what issues they're, if any, in the locker room that they're facing now, other than what I hear or assumptions. So um, if there are problems within the locker room, uh, you know, that's too bad. Yeah. Eric, you know, you, you've obviously made your name as a commentator, but you were a big uh, financial guy. You started out in, in the financial world. Is this all part? I mean, the NFL is big business. Is this all uh, this- part of... Andrew, this is bullshit. Yep. Is what it is. I started out in baseball first. I was playing for the Pirates, <laughs> and then went into into business world. Like I got into politics, and and unfortunately, politics is now overriding everything. These sports used to be uh, you know, kind of there used to be a, a, a firewall that that whatever happened in, in D.C. and in, the, in this political world never made it over the firewall into, into the stadium. It's bullshit. What's going on right now? Rob Manfred, the Major League Baseball commissioner, pulled the All Star Game. Remember, the All Star Game means guys coming from all over the country it means tourism will come to the to the area wherever the all-star game is being played a hundred million dollars in revenue is going to be pulled from cobb county georgia because of that one move of, of, of rob manfred and we just found out today that the likely new stadium that they're going to play the all-star game in is going to be in denver colorado Look at the two voting rights. This is an issue over voting rights that Manfred is caving to the cancel culture mob over. Voting rights in Colorado are more restrictive than they are in Georgia, where Manfred is pulling the Major League Baseball game out of. 
The other issue, Marco Rubio yesterday wrote a letter and it was terrific. Like him or not, I'm not a huge fan of Marco Rubio. I think he's a little bit too Ryan, fake conservative. I'm a real conservative. Don't like him. But he wrote a letter to directed to, to MLB commissioner saying, by the way, you pulled the game out of the state of Georgia over their voting, their new voting rights law. Are you, sir, Rob, going to pull yourself out of the Augusta National Golf Course because you're a member there. So if you have a problem with Georgia, with the in sport and in, in, in kind of promoting sports in Georgia, which you represent MLB, how about you you live, you you walk the walk, not just talk the talk. Well, this is the strange thing to me. I mean, I've been an NFL fan for well as long as I can remember, and this this year is the first year I could not bring myself to watch a game because of the politics. You know, Brett, you you actually caused some controversy when you tweeted at one point that you were going to vote for Donald Trump. It all seems to be on one side. Uh, you said both sides, and and I can understand that, but it all seems to be, I mean, it's controversial for you to support Donald Trump, but it's not controversial for teams to, for instance, kneel during the national anthem. Doesn't it seem that it all goes one way? Well, absolutely. It's very lopsided, and whatever happened to... Um, you know, uh, your ideas, your thoughts, your beliefs being yours and not wrong. That that's, that's, that seems a distant past. Um, you know, I think the people who know me, in fact, I know the people who know me players that I played with, especially those who I played with for quite a long time, black and white, Hispanic, um, family and friends would, would certainly uh, attest to it as well that, uh, you know, I, by no means or any of us perfect, but, uh, you know, I, I'm f- the furthest thing from a racist. Um, I think I'm a pretty good guy who, who, you know, cares about other people as well. And, you know, I I knew that it was going to create a firestorm um, by first of all playing golf with the president, which I thought was an honor, regardless of who that president is. Yeah. Um, and and by tweeting um, my support for then President Trump, I knew that that would create some some more issues. But you know, again, I, I go back to the people who know me know me and uh, would would speak on, on my behalf in a positive light. And, you know, I, I really don't worry about it a whole lot. I mean, it's a shame. It's really a shame uh, that we've come to this. Um, but, you know, the whole saying, it is what it is. You know, I, I just find it tough. I got to be honest. The thing that I found really tough was the stuff about the national anthem and the flag uh, you know, I understand, we all understand there are always problems in our country and we got to talk to one another and work them out. But the flag is kind of what unites us all. And it's sort of, Absolutely. I, I mean, I, I, do you do you find this to be, when you talk to players, when you talk to, to guys, do, does anybody feel that this is a good thing, that, uh, that there should be anti-national anthem protests? I, I personally have not really... Um, had an in-depth conversation with any present player, or for that matter, former players or teammates. Uh, you know, it's 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 been talked about more in passing. Um, I, I, I guess the jury is out on whether or not it will be a good thing or not. I think it's created more turmoil than good. Um, but I, Andrew, I. I, I agree with you 100%. I think something has to unite us. And the game or games uh, or sport in, in the past has been some, kind of a unification. Yeah. Um, now it's almost like a division. Um, I can't tell you how many people, uh, including yourself, have said to me, I don't watch anymore. Um, it, 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 it's not about the game anymore. And I, I tend to agree. Um, you know, it, again, it's a shame. It, it's too too bad, you know, but, um, you know, like you said, you know, there's, there's, there's differences always. There's always been differences. Um, 
there's always been issues within the world, within the country, within our states. Um, but again, something has to unify us. And uh, I, I felt like the flag standing patriotically because blacks and whites and Hispanics have fought for this country, have died for this country. Um, and um, it, it's too bad. Eric, you know, you, you guys have this uh, podcast, uh, Bowling with Favre, uh, great name, by the way, but, uh, you know, you and you talk about trying to, to keep it light, trying to find the funny things and the good things about sports. Are you finding that difficult? I mean, even when you were speaking before, you sound like I can hear there's, there's anger there. I feel it, too. Is it hard to enjoy sports at this point or do you still find a way in? You know, we, we still find there's a lot of fun stories still in sports. And, and you know, it, Brett is so right. When, when you look at that flag, you, you see red, white, and blue. You don't see black, white, brown, Asian. You don't see those colors. You see red, white, and blue. And people on of every single race have died protecting what the meaning of that flag meant. So it's, it, it's just very hard to see athletes disrespect it. I come from an age, and I, I think everyone here comes from an age where it didn't matter on the sports field what color you were. If you were the best pitcher, you're the best quarterback, you're the best third baseman, you, you're the best uh, defensive hockey player. It doesn't matter what color you are, you're going to get the job. And, and unfortunately, now everything is everything is race. I mean, everything. how in the world do we get to a world where every single issue has become a racial issue? If you... Uh, recite the Pledge of Allegiance. It's now racist. I have to somehow apologize for being white because of something that may or may not have probably happened 50, 70, 100 years ago. It's just crazy. I, I, I just, I'm, I'm blown away and I just, I'm angry right now. Andrew, we do a fun podcast. We have a lot of fun. We talk about Kardashians. We talk about everything that's going on. We talk about sports. We, we had Dr. Phil on a couple of weeks ago. Just had some, had some fun. But I have to point something out because this, this MLB thing hits home so hard to me as a former player. Um, they, they, again, Major League Baseball took the game out of Atlanta, which is, I believe I'm right in saying it's 50% African-Americans in Cobb County. If, I'm, if it's not Cobb County, it's, it's Atlanta, Georgia. And took it and brought it into the city that, that is in Denver, where the, where, the, where the ball field, the course field in Denver is, which is less than 10% African-American. Now, this whole thing is all about voting rights and African-Americans believing that this new Georgia law will prohibit African-Americans from getting to the voting booth. But you're going to you're going to punish a city that's 50 percent African-American and reward one that's less than 10. I think it's nine point seven percent African-American. It makes absolutely no sense. And, you know, I, I, I'm going to say here for the first time, I'm going to say it again on TV a little bit later today. MLB is BLM, Black Lives Matter, backwards, and that's exactly what they're doing to the, to the Black Lives Matter movement. It's <laughs> a good point. Well, in the hopes, in the hopes that we can get back to sports at some point, and in the hopes that uh, this will, this too will pass. I got to ask you some sports questions while I've got you here. Uh, the game, the the game of football has been dominated for certainly the last uh, few years by by Tom Brady. And I, I don't take anything away from Tom Brady, but but he kind of plays like a surgeon. He's a very serious kind of you know exact player. When I used to watch you, Brett, you were you had a you were more like an artist. You had a kind of spontaneous uh, pleasure in just sometimes doing the craziest mm -hmm. thing that you thought would work. Uh, when you look at the game, do you see any players coming up who remind you of yourself? I think uh, there's a couple of guys that uh, I, I see some similarities uh baker mayfield patrick mahomes um would be two that come to mind um you know maybe i should have been a little more serious maybe i could have won some, <laughs> a few more super <laughs> i i say that jokingly uh you know i wouldn't take anything away from how i played you know uh, i i could never be tom brady and, and vice versa um you know, I think that's what the beauty of sports is. It takes it, it, all kinds. And uh, when you know, I always say the good teams are like good gumbo, when you when the, the ingredients come together just right, you hit a home run. And, um, and yeah, that's, that seems to be the case for Tom uh, each and every year that he finds a way to to bring the team. 
I mean, I think we found out more than any, anything uh, who more than the other led the charge and was more responsible for winning the Super Bowls. Was it Bill Belichick, who I think is a tremendous coach, or was it Tom Brady, the gel that really kind of kept the, those teams together? He goes to Tampa, misses all of all season because of the pandemic, was thrown in the parking lot at one time to try to get some chemistry, um, was not able to meet in person with these guys for the most part, but yet they won a Super Bowl. Um, yeah. But, um, but yeah, Baker Mayfield, I think, uh, and, and Mahomes play like me, seem to have that fun. Baker probably more so than, than Patrick. Um, and w the willingness in – and the uh, the daredevil, you know, a uh, side of of either to make any throw from any any place on the field. I think can yeah. I can I jump in watching Brett yeah. grow up watching Brett uh, throw the ball all over the field in any which way. I, I, I you got a lot of Mahomes in you, Brett. I mean, just, it, it, it's almost a mentality, and it's almost like a second baseman and a shortstop having that mentality. I'll get the ball to you whether I have to you know drop it or have bat, flip it behind my back. Mahomes does it, and, and you had a lot of that. You were you weren't always over the top. You know they say get your arm, get your elbow up. You were all th three quarters. I see Mahomes <laughs> shuttle passing all over the place. I see a lot of that in you. I see more. I, I, I got to say, than Baker. When when I asked the question, Mahomes was the guy in my mind. I got to say, I, I yeah. see a lot of uh, uh, Brett and him too. I did, do you do you think these these guys who come in who they they always sports casters especially sports writers love these these running quarterbacks, but it always seems to me that they last for one year that they run and then they get hit a couple of times and then the bosses just say you know we're risking this big investment. Is is the running quarterback? I mean the you know the serious running quarterback is that an overrated uh, player? Um, once they get hurt, yes. <laughs> Overpaid, too. You know, two, three guys come to mind uh, just right off the top of my head. Randall Cunningham sort of paved the way for running to be a, 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 a tremendous threat to any defense you face. Then Michael Vick. Michael Vick. And then Lamar Jackson. Um, I mean, there's no question – that if you can do both and do both well, it puts a, a extreme, um, you know, set of problems with within a defensive scheme. So uh, what you've seen to counter that is teams have drafted the hybrid players, the the defensive ends that run four six but are six foot six two seventy. Uh, the you know a big strong semi quick guys don't cut it you know, for the running quarterback, you know, the, the, their, their tongues are dragging. Uh, so that they're, they're drafting linebackers and defensive ends that can run relatively close to, to what these quarterbacks can run. And it only takes one hit to, you know, change the mindset or change the, the approach that the offense uh, has taken with what they call these RPOs now, run pass option. Um, you know, I, 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 I doubt presently too many defense coordinators want to face Lamar Jackson when he's healthy. Um, but again, if it, if it ever, if he ever gets injured, say he sprains an ankle and, and has to rely on in the pocket and throwing, um, it remains to be seen how he will, uh, will play then, but certainly a dynamic player, uh, much like Vic was and Randall Cunningham. Randall was a tremendous passer. So, uh, equal, you know, equally a threat running and throwing. So let me ask, I, I got one only time for one more question, but I'd like to ask you both, uh, you know, football, especially sports in a lot of ways in general, but football especially has faced a lot of big problems in these last few years. The politics is one thing, the injuries and the idea that it, the game can't be made safe that has led moms and schools to not want to send their kids into football. Are you hopeful about the future of, of professional football? Let me ask you both that question. Well, I'm hopeful, but I'm, I'm also uh, 
a little bit concerned at the direction in which we're going from a political uh, point of view, but also from an injury, mainly um, probably more than anything, the concussion issue. Um, guys are bigger, guys are faster, guys are stronger. Rules have changed in, in favor of protecting uh, against the concussion. But as you know, they're going to happen. Um, I mean, you can trip and fall walking out of your house and get a concussion. So they're going to happen. Um, there, there's just not anything from a treatment standpoint until they, you, you can only do so much to prevent, but they're going to happen. Uh, so I'm, I'm, I'm hopeful, but I'm also a little bit concerned about the direction we're going in in both of those areas. I, I'll, I'll jump in because I've been a football fan for my whole entire life. And look, football is big business. So it, by definition, it will survive. And, and Brett's right. They're going to have to, there's going to have to be some changes made. They're going to have to continue to invest, if not millions, hundreds of millions of dollars into, into technology, helmets, et cetera. And the rules will probably change. I, it, look what's going on. I think the, I'm not mistaken, the minimum salary of an NFL player right now is $610,000. And that's because as Brett points out, you, you can get injured faster. I'm sure the lifespan of a, of a, of a, a typical average football player went from what maybe five or six or seven years, maybe it's down to four or five. And then, so they have to compensate that way. But because of the demand for the sport, which is off the charts, higher than demand for any other sport on the planet, it, it, it'll continue. And I, I think what we just saw is I, I think we're going to see an extra game now. And so there's actually demand for more football, not less. So I'm pretty sure it's going to survive. They just really, really need to protect the players a little bit more on their health, as, as Brett points out, con concussion wise, and also on their money and salary. So if you're only going to be around two or three years, then, then jack the numbers up. They're making tens of billions of dollars profit uh, at the NFL. So they can afford it. Eric Bowling, Brett Favre, uh, Favre, one of the greats who ever played the game. Really nice to meet you both, and uh, thank you so much for coming on. I appreciate it. Thank you, Clayton. You're very welcome, Andrew. Thank you. All right. The time is passing so quickly. The Clavenless week is coming at us like a truck, a burning truck. But, but between us and that doom is the mailbag. <laughs> All white people are racist. <laughs> so true. It's just so true. Uh, from Thomas, Dr. Strange Glavin, I've asked this several times, but you've never answered. Maybe I'll get lucky this time unless I fall victim to that dreaded mind zap gap, whatever that is. Uh, I believe in God, but I've always been unconvinced about Jesus as God or the Son of God. Help me believe. I want to believe. I've read your autobiography, but I'm still not there. Um, I would be forever in your debt. From Tom, he says, I came for Ben's hard facts. I stayed for your insights and wisdom. Hot Gandalf. Um, so I'm, I will give you an answer. Uh, it's a complicated answer, but uh, I can't give you the answer because I think there are different answers for each person. Uh, this is mine. I, I don't think you're asking me for historical proof. There are many, many good reasons why you should believe the gospel writers. Um, they're, they're, they're witnesses. They are the reports of witnesses. They are better witnesses than, for instance, Alexander the Great ever had. The only reason people dismiss them is because things happen, ex such extraordinary things happen in them that they don't believe in those things. As I've said before, if they were discussing an alien from outer space, people would believe them. It's what they don't believe is they don't believe in the spiritual. They don't believe that the world is underlined, uh, underlay by consciousness. They think everything is material, which makes absolutely no sense. So I don't think you're asking about that. If you are, uh, I think it's Father Barron wrote a really good piece for the Saturday Wall Street Journal about Easter and why we should believe in the resurrection. You can look at that, but that's not, I think, what you're asking. I think you're asking why, why Jesus is even necessary. We believe in God, but why Jesus is necessary. Let me read you a short poem by William Wordsworth, okay? He says, my heart leaps up when I behold a rainbow in the sky. So was it when my life began? So is it now? I am a man. So be it when I shall grow old or let me die. The child is father of the man, and I could wish my days to be bound each to each by natural piety. Now, this was written when great minds were dealing with the rise of science, right? And the French philosophers had touted reason and ended with a reign of terror. They had said, everything is going to be reason now. We're going to live by reason. We're going to worship reason. And they ended up in just blood-soaked uh, terror. And the Romantics, of whom William Wordsworth was one of the best and one of the most conservative, the Romantics had to ask themselves, 
where do, what does reason stand on? That's where we began talking about Ayn Rand. What is the relationship between the inner man and the world and what we, they called nature? I call it creation. And Wordsworth ultimately called it creation too. Science for them was represented by Newton. And one of Newton's experiments was with a prism looking at the rainbow. Okay. He looked at the rainbow and he discovered something really interesting that when, um, when, separate, when rainbow colors are passed back through a second prism, they don't go back to being white. They don't come join back into white light, right? The prism breaks them apart, but doesn't bring them uh, together again. The rainbow colors are actual colors. The rainbow is not a scientific trick of the glass prism. I'm reading this from one of my favorite authors, Richard Holmes, The Age of Wonder. He says, the rainbow was not a mere scientific trick of the glass prism. It genuinely and beautifully existed in nature through the natural prism of rain, through the natural prism of raindrops. But paradoxically, it takes a human eye to see it, and every human eye sees it differently. So here's this fantastically beautiful thing that actually exists. It's not a trick. It's not an illusion. It's a real thing, but only the human eye can perceive it. And when the human eye perceives it, the heart, as Wordsworth said, leaps up. And he says, this is natural piety. It is the human experience is a real experience but it also is a creative experience. It creates the things it sees, but the things it sees are really there. It's a very complicated idea. So when we're looking at morality, right, not rainbows, when we're looking at morality, we're also looking at something real. When we're looking at beauty and truth, these are also things that are real, but we're seeing them as only human beings can see, and each one of us is seeing them a little bit differently. We're seeing the same things we're not, we can't just make up morality. We can't just say, oh, it's fine to kill a, a child for fun, and that'll be our morality. We can't do that. But we all see the, the moralities. We see colors a little bit differently, all right? That was what the romantics were dealing with. They were dealing with the fact that the person is an instrument for perceiving moral reality, well, a spiritual reality, right? And we know this because we know that people can be demented. We know that they can see things falsely. We know that they can go crazy and have a, a delusions. So we know that they can also see them truly, even if each one of us sees it a little bit differently because we're individuals, all right? So there must be, at least in theory, a human who is the model for what we see. Each one of us may only see a little bit of what he sees, but there must be a model of what the human sees because the moral world is perceived by humanity. Now listen, on Mars or planet Ektok 12, th they may be a different entity that perceives the moral ra reality, but here it is the human being, right? Here it is the human being. So Wordsworth's friend Coleridge, who was a Christian, said, might not Christ be the world as revealed to human knowledge? a kind of common sensorium, the total idea that modifies all thoughts. A sensorium uh, is an apparatus of human sensation. So he is the model for our perception, right? He is the thing we are trying to get to. And that's why Christ said he is the vine. He's the, the actual plant, the actual core human. And we're the branches on the vine. And if we cut off the branches, they fall down and die, just like branches in real life. But if we put the branches on that human perception, we grow, we become something unique, and yet something that is part of something bigger than ourselves. We become the God-made man. So what I would say is this, when, when you see the moral world, are you seeing what Christ sees? And if you're not, do you find again and again that you turn out to be wrong? That's one of the things that happened to me. I found out that when I was saying things opposite to what Christ said or different than what Christ said, I was wrong and he was right again and again and again. So it is something that you have to try out through faith. You can only find it through faith. But once you have that faith, you will find that your life becomes deeper. Your moral understanding becomes deeper. Your, uh, your experience of the world becomes richer and your heart will leap up when you see the truth. And that is the proof that Jesus Christ is God and that is, is Lord. And, and it's available. It is available to anyone who grasps it. It really is. And if you find out it's not, hey, call me up and tell me I was wrong. I'm not going to wait for that. I'm not going to hold my breath waiting for that uh, phone call. Uh, let's do a video question. You know, we haven't had a video question for a long time. We love video questions. Please send in videos. Uh, we will happily do them. We will not put them above written questions because some people don't want to be on um, on TV. They don't want people to see them. That's fine. So we will just take good questions, but we got a video question this time, so I want to use it. This is from Trevor.
Hey all Clavin, King of the Multiverse. My name is Trevor and I'm a military musician. I was just curious to know if you were to address an audience that was strictly military from the top brass all the way down to the junior enlisted, what would you say? Hmm. <laughs> that's, a, that's a good question. I was never in the military. I regret it. I have to tell you, I regret that I wasn't, but I wasn't. I grew up in the 60s during the Vietnam War and was part of all, you know that to some degree and sort of thought, well, that's not a, a thing that I should do. Um, but I do regret it. And, and here's the thing I have come to feel about the military. And I think what I would say, I think some people know this, but haven't thought it through. Military service is not transactional. You don't do it because your country is right. Pat Conroy, the author of a famous novelist, wrote uh, Prince of Tides. Uh, Pat Conroy uh, was also anti-military and anti-Vietnam. And he too said that he regretted it. And he said, America is a good enough country to die for even when she's wrong. You do what you do because your country is a force for good, even though the people in it are flawed like all other people. And you do it because it becomes a man to serve his country. It becomes a man to serve his country. It becomes a man to love his country. Breathes there a man with soul so dead who never to himself has said, this is my own, my native land. Uh, it, is, it is something that you do because it makes you into the person that you were supposed to be, especially, I, you know, I'm, I'm not running down women who serve their country, you know, God bless them. But I think especially for a man, uh, Samuel Johnson, uh, the famous lexicographer said that that was the only real employment for a man was to be a soldier. So what I would say is don't, you know, we shouldn't be afraid to act rightly for ourselves and to do the things that are becoming to our gender uh, and when you, uh, and, and to our country and to our lives. And so a person who is in the military is not performing a transactional deed. He's not doing something because he thinks his country is right. He is doing it because he thinks it is right to do. And I think you are doing it because it's right to do. And Trevor, I thank you for it. I thank all you guys and girls for your service in the military. And I would hope that that would be at least the beginning the beginning of a helpful speech. I haven't got time to make the whole thing, uh, but invite me and pay me thousands and thousands of dollars and I'll happily show up and give the rest of it. I have to stop there. The Clavenless Week is here. You're doomed. Forget about it. Everything I said is now nixed because you're finished. But, but if you crawl through the darkness, the gnashing of teeth, the screaming, the fireballs, the opening, the earth opening up, closing on you, on you, crushing you. If you survive all that and come back on Friday, I will be here again. I will still be Andrew Claven. This will still be The Andrew Claven Show. The Andrew Claven Show is produced by Robert Sterling. Executive producer, Jeremy Boring. Our technical director is Austin Stevens. Supervising producer, Mathis Glover. Production manager, Pavel Vidowski. Edited by Danny D'Amico. Lead audio mixer, Mike Cormina. Animations are by Cynthia Angulo. Production coordinator, McKenna Waters. And our production assistant is Jacob Falash. The Andrew Claven Show is a Daily Wire production. Copyright Daily Wire 2021. A YouTube star is accused of being a sex predator who preys on young boys. Joe Biden pushes for new gun control measures. Another shocking, quote unquote, twist in an alleged hate crime case. And a Republican legislator sparks controversy by comparing abortion to slavery. All of that and much more today on The Matt Walsh Show.